I know you won't believe this, but when I was in grade three, I had a teacher who for some unknown reason seemed to think I was very loud, <laughs> especially in the classroom. And I can't tell you the number of times that she would say to me, Richard, inside voice, inside voice. And uh, I've told Yvette that story, and so it's carried over. Sometimes we're in a restaurant, and we'll be talking back and forth, and I guess I can be a little bit louder than I anticipate, and Yvette will lean over and say, honey, inside voice. <laughs> well, this right now, for a couple of minutes, I want you to use your outside voice and tell me very loudly something, one thing that you're thankful for today. What are you thankful for? Oh, wow. Okay. Family. I heard family. What else? Life, health, friends, music. That's a big one today. Food. Ah, someone else. Who said that? After my own heart. <laughs> oh, of course, Nancy Fitch. <laughs> Worship, yes, thank you. Nancy Fitch says food, Mark Ryan says worship. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> One of the Kerwin clan then. <laughs> what is it? Oh, spiritual food. Nancy's trying to make up now. <laughs> Sp spiritual food. Church, wonderful. Freedom, yes. Friends, big one. Pardon? Family, thank you, Janet. Salvation. Wow, you can go on and on. Where's, where's Bill Kerwin? Oh, there he is. Bill, I know Bill is very shy. And if he weren't so shy, I know he'd be shouting out, he's thankful that so far this season, the Habs are undefeated. <laughs> I did notice nobody shouted out the Blue Jays. Now we have to have faith. Tonight will be the change. Now I know we could go on and on here today, but we're going to focus on five reasons from the scriptures, from the scripture that Sandy read this morning, five reasons that the psalmist in Psalm 103 tells us that we have to be thankful. Five things we should be thankful for. Notice what he begins by saying. He says, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, for some reason, question I'm going to ask you now, completely threw the bridge crowd off. They, they really struggled with this one. I thought it was a pretty simple question. But tell me, let me ask you this. Tell me this. Who is the psalmist addressing in this psalm? Someone said God. That's the answer that was given in the bridge. Exactly. Himself. Look what he says. He's not talking to God right now. He's talking to himself. He said, why is it in church, whenever a pastor asks a question, people think the answer is either God or Jesus? <laughs> it's pretty safe, people think, to give one of those two answers. But in this time, he's talking to himself. He says, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He's talking to himself. He's giving himself a little pep talk. You ever do that? Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. He says it again. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He's talking to himself. And forget not all his benefits. And then he moves on and he says there's five things that he wants his soul, his inmost being, to be thankful for. And notice the first one that he says, who forgives all your 
sins. Someone pointed that out a minute ago from over here. They said salvation. Who forgives all your sins. Now those of us who have been a Christian for a while, it's easy to begin to take this for granted. And I know it's easy for me. And it's not until those wonderful moments when I see a person put their faith in Jesus Christ for the first time and experience the joy of having their sins forgiven. I see some of the choir nodding. They know what I'm talking about. Of having their sins forgiven that I realize afresh the joy of the forgiveness that we have in Christ Jesus, who forgives all your sins. Many of you know of the Christian writer Philip Yancey. You know Philip Yancey? He tells a wonderful story of a young teenage girl who grew up in Traverse City, Michigan. And around the age of 15, she got sick and tired of her parents' rules. They didn't. They complained about her nose ring. They complained about the length of her skirts. They complained about uh, the boyfriend that she had. They complained about her, the color of her hair. And she got sick of it, and she decided, it's time for me to leave home. And so she ran away. And she made her way to Detroit. And in Detroit, a uh, man happened upon her who treated her very, very nicely. She came to call him boss. He took her to a restaurant. He gave her a nice meal. He took her back to his place. He gave her a place to stay. He put a roof over her head. And of course, he was doing it for ulterior means. He knew that a young girl like her would earn a premium for him. And very soon, he sent her off to do tricks for him. And this went on for a while. She eventually became addicted to drugs. And during a period where she became very ill, he kicked her out and she quickly realized just how important or unimportant she was to him. And she found herself one night in the middle of Detroit in the downtown area. It was cold. She was shivering. She was trying to get a little bit of warmth through a grate in the sidewalk. And eventually the thought came to her, and she said, My cat back home is warmer and better fed than I am right now. And she decided to call home, and she called her mom and dad up very scared. And no one answered, and she left. She, she, she just hung up, and she called later a second time, didn't leave a message, and a third time, and a fourth time, nobody answered. Finally, she called a fifth time. And this time, she left a message. And she said, Mom, Dad, it's Sarah. I'm thinking about coming home. I don't know if I'm welcome or not. But I'm, going, I'm in Detroit. I'm going to take a bus to Traverse City Depot. And the bus stops there for 15 minutes. I'm going to get off. And if someone's there to meet me, I'll come home with you. But if you don't want me home, if I don't see anyone, I'll get back on the bus and I won't bother you anymore. And she, she got on the bus. She started heading for Traverse City. And she was getting a, a, a speech prepared in her mind just in case her parents were there. And she was working out what she was going to say to them. And the bus pulled into the depot. She had no idea what to expect. She got off the bus. She walked in and she couldn't believe her eyes. There in front of her was a group of 40 relatives. Her mother, her father, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, even a great grandmother. And they came running towards her, and in the midst of them, she saw her father. Her father came running up to her, sobbing, threw his arms around her, and she began trying to say the little speech that she had prepared. Dad, I'm, I'm sorry for what I've done. And he cut her right off, and he said, Sarah, there's no time for that. We've got a party planned for you. And they whisked her back home where they celebrated her return. Now this is a true story, 
but you know the story from the Bible that it reminds you of, the story of the prodigal son, a story that's repeated day after day all throughout the world. And this is what Jesus offers, who forgives all your sins. There was a young fellow, a young man, who was a brand new Christian, and he came to his pastor one day, and he said, listen, is it true that the Bible says that God has taken our sins and, and thrown them to the deepest part of the ocean? His pastor smiled and he said, yeah, that's what the word says. And he says, well, my teacher told me that some parts of the ocean are five miles deep. In fact, my teacher said that if the largest battleship in the world was sunk to that level that the pressure would be so great that the, the battleship would be crushed like an eggshell. The pastor said, well, yeah, I can believe that. I think your teacher's right. And the young man said, well, if my sin is that deep, then it, it ain't never going to come up again, is it? And the pastor said, no. It's never going to come up again. That is the wonder of the forgiveness of God who forgives all your sins. And then he goes on. He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Now let me point out first of all what this verse is not saying. It's not saying that no matter what disease you have, God's going to heal you. It is saying that he has the ability to cure every disease. There is nothing that is beyond God's ability. And sometimes in his own providence, he chooses to cure diseases. At times he chooses not. And that is a mystery of God's providence. But remember too, so that's the first thing I want you to understand. The second thing is, remember what we said at the very beginning. Remember who he's talking with here. He's talking to himself, his soul, his innermost being. And so first and foremost, the psalmist is reminding himself that God has the ability to heal every spiritual sickness that we have within us. He can bring healing. He can bring transformation. He can bring a new beginning who heals all your diseases. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, he redeems your life from the pit. The London Times newspaper publishes every week the selling price for every work of art the world over. It doesn't matter if a piece is sold in London or in New York or in Rome or in Paris. The world over, the London Times publishes the sale price for every major piece of art. You can tell how valuable an artwork is by how much it is sold for. In the same way, you and I can know how important, how valuable we are by how much Jesus paid for us. What was the price that Jesus gave for our lives? His very own life. Don't ever, ever say, that someone whom Jesus died for is worthless. If Jesus died for them, they are of infinite value. No matter what they've done, no matter what terrible deeds they've committed, in God's eyes, they are absolutely valuable. Who redeems your life from the pit. In the 1920s, there was a Texas governor named Pat Neff. 
and he once gave a speech to a large group of inmates from a number of local penitentiaries. And at the end of his speech, he said, if any of you would like to speak to me one-on-one, I'll remain behind. As you can imagine, quite a number of the inmates remained behind because a governor in the United States, then as now, has the power to what? Pardon. And he stood there for several hours while inmate after inmate after inmate came up to him and he heard variations of the same story that they had been, been found guilty by a travesty of justice, that they had been framed, that they didn't deserve this, that it was a miscarriage of justice, and on and on, until the very last man came. And he said, Governor, I just want you to know that I did the crime that I was committed, that I was convicted of. And I deserved the sentence I got. Every day that I have spent in prison has been valid and just. But I just want you to know that if I ever get a second chance, that I will do my best to bring honor to my name and to make up for the things that I've done. The governor that day commuted one sentence, pardoned one individual, and it was that one. Why? Because he admitted what he had done. And that's what God asks of us. He doesn't want excuses. He doesn't want rationalizations. He doesn't want justifications. He simply wants us to say, I am a sinner. I have done wrong things. I have done things I shouldn't have. I have left undone things I should have done. I am wrong. I am convicted. I am do any punishment that you hand down to me. And when we do that, he condemns us? No. He pours out his love and his forgiveness upon us. Who redeems your life from the pit. And then he goes on and crowns you with love and compassion. Pastor, I was reading I like to read other pastors' sermons. I was reading about a pastor um, from the 19th century who told a story of a young man in his 30s who had been a tramp and begging for many, many years. And uh, one day he got off a train at, in Pennsylvania. And he was very hungry and he saw another passenger there getting off the train. He saw him from behind and he went up and he knocked tapped on his shoulder, and he said, Sir, can you spare a little money for some food? And the man turned around, and they both stared at one another. The young man realized that he had tapped the shoulder of his father. And his father's eyes filled with tears, and he said over and over again, My son, my son, my son, my son. And he told him, I have been searching for you for 18 years. Everything I have is yours. Who crowns you with love and compassion. And finally, he reminds himself that God satisfies our desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I love Thanksgiving. I love it because it's a reminder to me of all the blessings that God has given to me. And I will admit that there's another reason why I love Thanksgiving, and that is because I am married to the best cook this side of the Rocky Mountains. And on holidays particularly, she pulls out 
all the stops. And she makes the best Thanksgiving meals that I can imagine with all of the fixings. And the funny thing is that I find her meals very, very satisfying, but at the same time, I'm never satisfied, which is one of the reasons I struggle <laughs> with my weight. They're satisfying, but I'm never satisfied. And that is what the psalmist is saying about the blessings of the Holy Spirit who satisfies your desires with good things. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago when the Holy Spirit pours out his presence upon us when we come to know him. There is nothing in our lives so satisfying. And yet, you will never be satisfied because you will never plummet the depths of your relationship with God. Every time you get to a lower level, you'll find that there is another level below that of intimacy and love and relationship. There is nothing more satisfying, but you will never be satisfied. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins. Heals your diseases. Redeems your life from the pit. And crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. We have so much reason today and every day to be thankful. Let us pray. Thank you, O God, for the blessings that you pour down upon us. We confess to you the times that we all take these blessings for granted. And we pray that you would help us, not just today, but every day, to be a thankful people living out our gratitude in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.